I suppose I should probably talk about um, what I do. I mean, I, I teach anatomy and, you know, I'm I'm involved as a as a as a teaching fellow. And I, I do take issue with the term teaching fellow because um, whenever you go to conferences and talk to people and you say oh, I'm a teaching fellow, they go, what? What, what what's that and then I kind of sort of say well I'm, I'm a lecturer and 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 actually that would make sense because I do a lot more lecturing than some lecturers who are on a balanced pathway so I I've never really kind of got gotten on with that that kind of title but I um I don't mind it apart from that reason which is that people other people outside of the university don't really understand it so Basically, I came into sort of education. I would have been, my background is kind of like widening access. I was definitely kind of like the first generation of my family to university. Um, I, I really had to think about my financial situation when I went. And um, I, I kind of ended up at university and kind of thought, you know, heard other people speak and kind of thought to myself, okay, is that really how other people speak? Like, um, is is are they not putting on that that voice, that posh voice? I um, um, I, I took a while to fit in, and I guess that's kind of, you know, um, shaped who I am and the way that I approach education. So I teach anatomy, and it has been modernised recently. You know, over the last sort of ten years, it's been a real hotspot for technology enhanced learning. But I've I've kind of thought about well, what what's the goals of this? And I'm not going to talk about anatomy too much today because it's not really as an audience. Um, you know, I'm I'm talking much more about my my processes and my um, my my philosophy rather than my discipline. Um, but I guess you know it would be you know if, if I had a goal here in terms of teaching anatomy, it would be to to really ensure that that any knowledge is useful for clinical practice in terms of students graduating as doctors. And I've got a few problems because when I came in, I was trained as a uh, uh, in neuroscience. So my background is neuroscience and that was my research interest and particularly cognitive processes. So I actually sort of studied psychology and then I kind of went into behavioral neuroscience. So I brought that with me. And when when I sort of turned up in anatomy and, and they sort of said, well, what, what do you want to teach? And I sort of said, well, I want to teach neuroanatomy. And, and they go, it's all yours fine go for it nobody wants to teach that because it was seen as really really difficult and actually that's mirrored by students so this little image here sums up quite nicely about how students feel about neuroanatomy particularly clinical neuroanatomy I, I might add you know there's what they thought neuroanatomy was so they already thought it was fairly complex what it actually is oh my god that's that's complex and then what they actually remember in an exam so my challenge of being innovative, of trying to do things differently, was was taking a, a module really that had very low uh, evaluation scores on the basis that it was difficult. Uh, there was a lot to it. Um, the anatomy was really, really tricky, uh, and it still is. You can't change the difficulty of a subject area. Um, and and what made it worse was that we had this revalidation of our curriculums that what seemed to be happening all the time and. And, and so we've got this receding curriculum where basic sciences are being reduced down, shrunken down in the amount of time they're given in the timetable and replaced with professionalism skills. So I, I don't have a huge problem with professionalism skills in the sense that they are the sort of softer bedside manner skills which need to be taught um, to medical students. I think, you know, it, you know, for example, giving a patient bad news is a skill that should be learned professionally and actually isn't something you should just expect a student to graduate with. It's an important communication skill. And and so I, I was sort of faced with the fact that, you know, not only did I have a difficult subject to teach, but I had to teach it in even less time than the people before me. And so I thought to myself, well, what what approach should I take? And um, it seemed natural to me at the time that I would I would work in partnership with students. I've always sort of connected with students in a way that's probably, again, a, a little bit unorthodox in the sense that I've been quite informal with them. I talk to them about what I've done at weekends in lectures. I let them into maybe more of my life than some other lecturers who uh, remain much more professional when they engage with them in, in that sense. Um, and uh, with most of the things I've done, uh, and this is so so true of me. I, it's more luck than judgment that actually working in partnership with students um, it actually fits in really nicely with uh, the higher education higher education academies um, kind of philosophy. Which um, there's this document that I put here, which was actually um, uh, written in in 2014, um, and um, 
by Mick Healy. And, and there's a quote here that I've actually um, taken straight out of this quite lengthy document. And it says students are commonly engaged in course evaluations and in departmental staff student committees, but it's rarer for institutions to go beyond the student voice and engage students as partners in designing the curriculum and giving pedagogic advice and consultancy. So yes, we're quite used to having student representation. We have course reps, we have students sit on committees and we ask them their opinions, but this was going a step further. This was about investing in a partnership with them. This was meaning that you're co-owning things. You are, it, I mean, this document talks about agents of change, actually including students in the big decisions, curriculum reform, and even assessments and the kinds of, you know, there are challenges to that because there, there's obviously some barriers that need to exist between staff and students, um, particularly around assessments and various things and integrity. But but that shouldn't mean that you can't reach a compromise. And so I, I really went into this kind of full swing and I kind of thought to myself, well, you know, I'm I'm going to sort of thrust myself into this. And and to be honest, the the policies at the time that the, the kind of influenced how you could work with students were fairly rigid. It wasn't that easy to work side by side with students in a shared office where you needed to be co-working with them because you know, you've got other people taking private calls, you've got maybe sensitive material on screens. And But the, the, the faculty policy was quite tight, so I, I found it very difficult to find space in which to create a community of practice with my students to actually have this network with them. But what I've realised partnership was really, really good for is that you build these relationships and you get longitudinal integration. This was another challenge of anatomy is that we actually teach it in the first two years when students are very junior and they don't have any formal anatomy teaching for the remaining three years of their degree other than on placement. So um, they they have to retain it by using it and often they forget it because it's a such an information rich subject that you do either use it or lose it. And um, and so, yeah, the partnership approach was a great way of trying to do both of those things, build a community of practice, a network that offered longitudinal integration of the subject, welcoming students back, giving students a purpose and a reason to revisit the anatomy department because they were intertwined with other work that it was doing and, and also being consulted on a number of curriculum matters. So. The students as partners approach is something that I really embraced and, and it, it's important for this thing called crossover learning where you actually kind of blend the uh, formal and informal uh, you know, relationship that you have with students. And, and, it, and, and what it strikes me as it's very authentic. It actually you, you come you know, there's a there's a humanist aspect to it where you are just being yourself and you're not being this kind of academic professional. Um, and I think that it allows you to kind of create, uh, invest in students so that they are motivated in a way that isn't driven by assessment, that is actually an emotional involvement and attachment to a project where the rewards are the academic reward that they will get out of it. And here we've got a student who is presenting at a conference, as many of my students have presented at conferences and co-authored papers as rewards. And, and that is really a timestamp, a legacy that I really enjoy leaving. You know, it's it's not so much about sometimes the work itself. You know, the work may become outdated. Um, it may not be cited a huge amount um, Often, often we can't. I often can't tell the papers that are going to be cited a lot, and those that are going to have tumbleweeds blown across their their index. But I, um, you know, the, the main thing is is that it does leave a legacy for me working with those students at that particular time, and that's what I care about. So it's the um, it's the enriching the experience both for the students that you're working with and the student learners that are benefiting by the consultancy and the input of the senior medical students that are involved. Um, and of course, the benefit to the faculty of actually enriching the experience as from the perspective of the learners, which is, you know, you can't do, you can get as many academics around the table and to discuss things at the highest level you want. But unless you get students that are inputting into that, not through engagement, 
and not in a really formal process because actually you want students to feel relaxed so that they are happy to actually speak truth to power um, and if they are valued and, and you're very human about the way that you approach them with those kind of academic transactions it really encourages them to be themselves and and actually flag up things that that are real problems that they may not have had the confidence to talk about in a formal environment because um, they just may not have had the confidence. So in terms of um, unorthodox, I mean, this is um, when I actually sort of thought, well, how, how am I going to justify this terminology? I, I, I went straight to the dictionary. So what, what is I remind myself of what the, the definition of unorthodox is. And I, I like this bit here where it says he frequently upset other scholars with his unorthodox views. I actually thought that was that was somebody like, um, you know, writing about me personally. Um, I'm sure it isn't. But I love the fact that that's the example that's being used. Um, and of course, what's the other one? Unconventional, not based on conforming or what is generally done or believed. Well, what is unconventional and what is unorthodox about the way that I do things? And I, and, and I guess, you know, I've touched on it there, but essentially I have one big problem. Well, I have lots of problems, um, uh, which I won't go into now, but I have one big problem academically. Um, and that is, um, and this isn't just true of Southampton, but it's true of universities in general, which is, the fact that they are so risk averse um, and this was written in Times Higher supplement and um, uh, and, it, and it, it's a full article on how aversive risk, uh, how, how aversive universities are to risk, which is kind of goes against the grain of what universities are, are about, really, in the sense that they, they are about intellectual discovery through taking risk, um, calculated risk. I'm not talking about being reckless or careless. I'm talking about actual sort of saying, well, there is a risk, um, but just because there is, is a risk doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It just means we have to think carefully about how we do it. And, and I think this whole this thing about safety has kind of mutated into something that means that we're risk averse in kind of everything we do, including education. So the barriers and the challenges are that we are incredibly risk averse. So that makes it if you've got a bit of an innovative idea, it, it kind of makes it quite tricky to get off the ground. Um, you have to convince a lot of people. You have to, you know, you, you, you take an idea and you have to wait a long time for it to be discussed at, at various levels. So risk aversion definitely gets in the way. Um, the hierarchy is a problem. I don't have a problem with organisational structure of universities. So it makes sense to have have organisation. Um, I'm talking more about the relationships between stu students and staff. So that hierarchy of kind of keeping students at arm's length or, you know, that the staff are residing in their offices over here and um, and and learning takes place in one direction. You know, and that is that we, the experts, teach them, the students, uh, and uh, that's the way it should be done. You know, a, a university is a scholarly community, and, and and there should be free flowing of ideas, and uh, uh, and and learning takes place in both directions. So, um, I think traditionally, sort of, you know, very. Um, probably research focused, research heavy universities, Russell Group universities that seem a bit more entrenched in, in academic hierarchy than others. I, I think a, there has been a big improvement. I would actually say that Southampton is a bit more forward thinking with this. So certainly in, in recent years, I, I think it's come a long way. I think there are other institutions that still have some way to go, but I still think it's a problem in terms of working with students as partners. Managerialism is a huge one for me. I, I actually, um, when you're trying to do something, you're trying to get something off the ground. Um, there's nothing quite worse than somebody um, uh, responding to you in an overly business type professional way that makes it sound um, almost, it lacks warmth, doesn't it? You know, business like um, email correspondence. I, I really detest any emails that start with the, the sentence please be advised that on the phone and it's kind of like you know and generic email addresses and th th this idea that um you know the that there are corporate decisions that are made and they are just signed kind of served out to to people trying to do stuff and 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 it feels like there's a there's a a missing link between people on the ground trying to really do cool stuff and actually meaningful stuff stuff that matters and and those people making decisions and i'm sure it's not like that i just think it feels like that and i think that managerialism or at least the 
the, the, the kind of new managerialism that's that's eked its way into academic um, business is is um is made you feel less confident about your ideas and, and make you feel that maybe they're less achievable. I certainly feel that myself. Academic culture is quite a big one. I think that academic culture kind of is is a mixture of all those things and and can prevent you. And so I, I kind of try and challenge all of these things. And often that doesn't go down well. So I, I guess in some respects that's unorthodox to kind of not just follow suit or not just sort of fit in line with that and say well actually just because we've always done it this way doesn't mean that that's the way we have to continue to do it and actually it doesn't mean that academic culture can't change you know that we can't treat students differently uh in the future uh but culture is is, is slow to change we also, particularly with education, we have ethical overkill, I think, and approval process. I mean, I, I mean doing manipulating educational aspects is not too uh, risky. You know, if it goes badly, the worst that can happen is that students won't learn as well. I mean, we've just been faced with COVID and blended learning. We've got a bunch of students that are terrified that they're not going to learn as well as they would if they were doing it face to face. Um, and you know we've been forced into that and actually we we you know they will still learn they there will be aspects of their learning that will suffer but there may well be aspects of their learning that are unchanged the truth is is that um i think when we consider the risks involved with manipulating educational practice that it's it's far too heavy even doing a service evaluation or a simple evaluation these days we're not talking about uh, control groups or artificial environments where you're you're kind of causing stress or anxiety about examinations or anything else or something that's unexpected we're just talking about sort of basic approval processes there's quite a lot of bureaucracy wrapped up in that and that annoys the heck out of me um tech phobias i people always come to me as some kind of e-learning expert i'm not you know i go to anna ruff she knows stuff i don't i um i i I love the fact that in recent years, um, technology has become so much easier. So, you know, you you don't have to be Steven Spielberg to edit videos anymore. You don't have to understand coding to develop e-learning. It's kind of what I would call the DIY era where everybody, if you look at the apps available, you look at the mobile devices available, everybody has got an opportunity to do something without a huge amount of background skill or training. Um, and the problem we have is that we just don't have the time to do it. I mean, we we just have uh, too much of our core leadership, management and engagement roles that seem to dictate our, our daily workload. And, and this is another problem that I have, which is actually that, that scholarship and the stuff that underpins our teaching is seen as a hobby. It's seen as something which um, is a luxury. The, you keep it on the back burner and if every once in a while you get the opportunity to bring it to the front and do something then good for you but most people don't and actually but it, i think it's core i think it absolutely should underpin what we do that, that it's everything that we do should be um evidence informed because if it's not we leave it to intuition and i've had lots of personal conversations with people where intuition really bugs me which is this idea that people say well i've been teaching 30 years i know what's best for my students often when you do experiments you read the literature you'll find that the outcomes are very different to what you might intuitively believe. So for example, the idea that free text answers versus multiple choice questions, that somehow um, there is a, a, a discrepancy in the way that students respond to those. And, and actually there is, there, you know, there is some level of intuition to that, but, but actually it's just not a one size fits all thing. You know, it's actually quite nuanced. And I, I think that intuition is quite damaging where we just go, I don't need to read the literature. I don't need to do the studies myself. I know, intuitively what's right for my students and I'm going to make a decision I'm going to do this based on my 30 years experience or whatever it is and I, I think you know I'm intuition should give you an idea it should certainly be a, a form of creativity but it shouldn't be the reason you do something and I think that 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 is, is dangerous it wouldn't work in any other area of sort of academic research you wouldn't be able to use intuitions at the same level that you do in education and I and and, and I think that does need addressing so um, what I try and do and why, the way I get around it is to say, well, what am I already doing and how does that align to, to current educational theory? Now, my background is psychology, so I'm quite interested in this. So we've got cognitivism. That's the way in which people think. That's the, the whole aspect of um, 
how students actually um, cognitively process information when, when we provide it and we should think about that you know we should think about how they problem solve how they retain how their memory processes work when we when we give them memorable learning experiences and I think cognitivism fits in really well with e-learning and it's certainly something that I've done and I will talk a bit more about that in my educational um, projects behaviorism came in the 70s it, it's kind of taken over by cognitivism and actually goes quite well the two the two go quite well together but actually philosophically are very very different um, if you think of behaviorism you'll be thinking of sort of bf skinner and the rats and all that stuff essentially we're saying that in education the stuff that's measurable is the only stuff you can trust so actually you know you need to be able to measure learning gain to say that something you've done has worked you need to be able to say well was there an improvement in assessment scores because we've seen a change in behavior in medicine it would be have we seen a change in their clinical competency before they couldn't do um, this particular skill uh, cannulate or take blood now they can so um, it's quite it's, it's measurable so that's what I like about behaviorism but it's, it's, it's fairly outdated the one that everyone likes these days is constructivism uh, and that's because it kind of takes um, into uh, account how learning is constructed and the context and the environment in which it's constructed um, it kind of fits in quite well I think with this whole idea of sort of facilitation I didn't go and teach I didn't you know I'm not an expert in this field and I go and teach I facilitated a session um, somebody once and I, I do like I don't know whether I agree with it totally but I do like this idea that um, somebody called it yeah the anti-knowledge approach where actually you can you could facilitate anything you know, if you're if you if you're if you've got an experienced person who actually can manage a educational setting rather than have expertise in the area, if the students are working together and they're problem solving on their own, you can facilitate their ability to be able to do that without knowing anything about the subject matter. That worries me a little bit because I I do think that that kind of takes away the need for people that have a pedigree a, a rich understanding or expertise in an area but it's certainly um, something that we should invest in because it teaches lots of those transferable skills that we need for employment for graduation so i quite i kind of like it um and i think you know not uh, you can rely on all of these things i quite like um, multimedia learning it fits in with cognitivism it fits in with what I'm doing so I'm constantly thinking how's the stuff I'm already doing aligning with existing educational theories and how can I make it better and I think that's a great starting point um, I use this book by Richard Mayer um, which builds into the idea of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning I've had lots of conversations with David Reed about this and um, it's a really good if you if you haven't read this book it's a really good one um, and and probably is quite um, topical right now with people doing e-learning um, the new kid on the block is connectivism uh, and transactional distance theory that's that's because of um, online theories I think um, the theory of transactional distance by Moore is the only pure kind of um, online theory connectivism I, I, I've got a colleague called uh, um, Nick Fair who who knows a lot about connectivism it's sort of talking about the ways in which students are connected and the way that they get information online you know from various different places and where they can trust it and where they can't and, and actually encouraging them to have a process an iter iterative process whereby they have a system that allows them to go out and fetch knowledge use knowledge and, and, and keep it in an organized way particularly when learning remotely and so connectivism is kind of like the new kid on the block I only really started thinking about it recently I didn't know too much about it so I'm fairly new to this uh, this now and I'm, I'm sure there's probably people listening that know more about it than me but anyway so th that's kind of where we're coming from and then I kind of say well it's pedagogy first so when I look at everything that I do I'm actually saying well there's two things that um, really matter if we look at this technology enhanced learning evaluation then we'll say well okay there's two things going on here one is learner satisfaction the student experience the other is learning gain so that is did they learn okay um, and there's a, a few things that we should think about so what we shouldn't do is judge student learning on how engaged students look students can look engaged but not be um, and they cannot look engaged but actually be fully engaged um, so that's that's something we can't trust but it's again intuitive to do um, we shouldn't base decisions purely on teaching experience or intuition we've been through that and, and it's all very well saying um, did they learn more did they if they use videos for example and or videos of your lectures did they did they learn equivalently or did they learn more or less than what they would have done face to face well that's that's one way of looking at it but actually they're 
are other things to think about and that's the types of engagement or the types of behavior um, and we should also look at things like time on task well actually if they're spending more time on task um, that's also a gain if they are doing things more efficiently so they're learning the same amount in less time that's also a gain if they are more persistent and more motivated as a result of the activity that you're giving them that's also a gain and so these are effective behavioral and cognitive elements of engagement which are actually seldom discussed in my experience i'm sure there will be people involved in education that know about this stuff but i'm talking about teaching fellows that actually have an area of expertise and they they, they dip into um, the pedagogy they're not experts in it and i'm certainly not this is stuff that i've learned over time so the other thing we shouldn't do is making assumptions about digital natives you know the idea that somehow they're more tech savvy than us they're more used to technology they're more used to going to youtube as a source of information than a book that they've been brought up with that but it, th there's no evidence to suggest whatsoever that they are they they either prefer all of the technology based um, learning that we offer them or that they're somehow more savvy with um, applications or software than than anybody else. Um, it's just what they've been brought up with so that we, we shouldn't make. And that's what the evidence tells us. And, uh, and and I think we need to be wary of those. I mean, I haven't gone into learning pyramids and learning styles. That's because I think they've been debunked enough. I don't think there's anybody listening that really, truly believes that, um, that, that they should be considered anymore, although they still pop up from time to time. So um, let's have a look at my education portfolio. What have I actually done? Well, in terms of working with students as partners, I've kind of been a bit disruptive here and there. I've, I actually um, have got my own kind of interactive and, and, and video based platform, which is Sot and Brain Hub, which teaches neuro to my students and to others. So it's an evidence informed multimedia resource. And when I first launched this, I did get some backlash. So, you know, there was this, well, videos are passive. Videos aren't quite as, they're not going to be as effective as, as learning anatomy for real. And I never intended them to take over. They were always supposed to be supplementary and adjunct to what I was doing with my face-to-face -face teaching. Then I bought in the Near Peer Teaching Network. And um, this is a group that involves themselves in teaching other students so it's a group that are interested in teaching and they also teach teaching skills to other students as well so when they get very good and they've got lots of teaching experience they do that um, and then there's the national undergraduate neuroanatomy competition which is our external our, our external facing projects which is a national competition for all students in medicine to come and take if they want to and it has enterprise potential um, it's, it has a reputable return for the university um, and it provides us with uh, nationwide data that we can use for research uh, in terms of performance and it can inform policy and practice much more broadly um, because of the, the data that we get from beyond our own institutions. So it's quite useful. You'll notice that we were very, very lucky Saturday, the 29th of February 2020, just before the first lockdown struck, we actually got this in as a live face to face event. Seems like uh, uh, ages ago since uh, anybody did anything um, that was just a normal event, like a normal conference or something. I think the trick here is what I've done um, and is, is is brand everything, label everything, give it a name. If you've if you want to talk about the collective thing that you're doing give it a name um, and I, I find it makes it much easier to invest in it makes it a lot easier for other people to buy into as a project as a concept if you give it a name and make it a collective um, you know use for, for what it is that you do and, and, and what, where your skills are so this is my portfolio of work um, and you can see here that you know we have um, uh, a video playing here of all the different things that students have contributed. Students have contributed to all of this, um, this stuff. So the screencast and, and podcast development since 2014. Um, these actually incorporate some really good metacognitive principles like space learning, um, gaps for retrieval, which are really good, efficient ways for teaching. There's even some um, uh, pictures there of our students that are involved in presenting this work and at the forefront of delivery. Here's the YouTube page. And actually, let's see where we are with the YouTube setup as we stand. So we've got 145 videos 
25,000 subscribers, 2.5 million views globally. Um, the UK is not even the biggest user of this resource. It actually is third uh, after um, USA and India. 90% um, are co-produced and 80% are narrated by students. And I've already presented research findings that show that actually it's the student narrated ones that seem to um, have the most traction on YouTube, probably due to the way that they describe concepts and things that they've learned recently in, in, that, in that right language, that, that right level of, of, of communication for the, the learners actually um, on the receiving end. So um, that's the, the online um, learning platform. And of course, I've written about this. I've got a textbook chapter and I, I've been um, conducting research on it. There is absolutely no detriment to using videos compared to using a textbook. There is actually enhancements to be made if you're using interactive video um, over textbooks when it comes to retrieval or retention uh, three months uh, after the initial learning took place, or at least that's what our initial findings have shown us. And this does need um, to be repeated and generalised. So it's very tentative, but certainly the, it's looking good at the moment for the use of videos, which is quite handy when we're using so much of them. So um, we do have an iterative process. You might be thinking, well, what about the actually an instructional design? Well, we can see here that actually we use, if we start over on the left-hand side, we've got images and animations created in Procreate. That's a tool that you can find on the iPad. The, the student writes the script. We have quality assurance measures which are injected in the state. <laughs> OK, that that sounded interesting. Uh, OK, so uh, we've got um, the quality assurance process. We've got all the editing software where it's imported. And then we've got the storyboard creation where the principles of the cognitive theory of multimedia learning comes in just very quickly. That's about how you space out pictures and images. Um, you don't have unnecessary information. You have pieces of information that come up at the right time um, that draw the viewer's attention to the most important things at that moment um, and you have the right speed of learning so you can you, you don't want to slow things down so much when students are, have a good understanding of the background you want to make sure that's fairly swift but when you are actually going through new concepts you slow it right down and even repeat things in a slightly different way and so thinking about the cognitive theory of multimedia learning and building that in actually trains the student in, in good processes. And these are things that they may well be able to use later in their careers. So we've got the narration that's added with a microphone. Then we've got the post-production. Um, and then we've got further student and staff review. We've got further staff quality assurance. And then it can be used for blended learning and used and integrated into the playlists on VLE. So you might be wondering, well, actually, how do we use this in our applications? Well, we're actually using it on Blackboard. We're using it in our lab books as QR codes. We're using it on Instagram as just quick revision guides and on our website as downloadable things that, you know, downloadable PDFs that students can use for notes. We're also got playlists that are embedded into our teaching. What you're seeing on one side of the screen here is uh, something built in Articulate Storyline with the help of the digital learning team, which is a, a problem solving exercise, a clinical scenario. On the other side, you're seeing our up to date anatomy book actually built in Microsoft Sway, which actually involves lots of the student created resources and normally a little biography about the student and how they can make, you know, so we've got links to podcasts, to videos, breaking up the text, spacing out activities for good metacognitive um, learning where they have activities that involve some reading, some watching videos, but also some chances for retrieval. So the educational applications have also been published, but we, we did do some peer assisted learning actually face to face. We still managed to do some of that. And actually one of the things that, that happens with the peer assisted learning is that we publish a lot on it. So look at all the names of these students that are on these papers. OK, I've I've you know, deliberately put the students at the forefront of this. Um, and we have had a number of papers and actually people come to us now to invite me, not just me, but also my students to give talks, to run workshops on the benefits of near peer teaching in their discipline. It's transferable uh, and people are citing their work. And, and that makes me very, very proud indeed, because there is a real true pedagogical basis to it. 
In terms of innovation and enterprise, of course, we've taken it one step further. So the students are actually involved in running this national event. There's not much chance in the curriculum for many students to actually be involved in actually having ownership and running their own event where they're in control of everything, the finances, the organisation, the catering, the speakers, the, the actually question writing and thinking about assessment and actually having that checked by uh, a scientific body and, and experts. And they have learned lots about the processes of what we do behind the scenes as academics. And I think that makes them much more rounded in terms of when they look at their teaching and they look at how difficult it is for, for the things that we're trying to do for them. I, I often think there's hidden heroes amongst um, the workforce in academia where there's lots of people trying to get exam results um, released on time, people desperately trying hard to um, do the data so that it, it, there's a breakdown of how students performed in different areas so it's useful feedback for students and the amount of time that takes to do it for whole cohorts you know I think giving them an insight to this by doing it themselves actually makes them understand just how hard um, staff work for students behind the scenes although they may not see it but again you know the papers that we've published with students being first authors and many co-authors you're actually, it's not just about the competition, it's about um, innovation. It's about their own professional development. That was our first paper, it was actually about professional development. It wasn't even about how students perform. Um, then we've, we've done five years of educating, inspiring and motivating our future neurologists and neurosurgeons. We've actually looked at the amount of students that attend our competitions and how they use either being placed, being, being a distinction winner, or a runner up and how they've gone on to use that in interviews or on their portfolios and actually that has measured the impact of the competition over the course of five years and very recently and this one is we're very proud of is the neuroscientist is, is a really leading journal in in um in clinical neuroscience it's actually got an impact factor of 6.791 which is actually quite good for me okay so I know you know it's not nature I get that okay it's I I appreciate that it's not it's not science but for me you know I'm proud of this it's got a huge number of students on it all which made valuable contributions to this over eight years um, to actually think about the lessons we learned from this um, project we have spent a lot of time sharing the impact and good practice. It continues at faculty level, institutional level, national level and international level. We've got the highest module rating now in, in the undergraduate curriculum. Um, we went from the worst to the best. You know, that that's um, that's something that's been sustained over a few years. We found that the supplementary teaching method using the, the videos is, is better than just the practicals alone. We've shared our good practice through CHEP, as, as Helen mentioned right at the beginning about those connections there and sharing it across the university. And we've got all these other institutions and places that are using our resources worldwide. So that's something that me and the students can be very, very proud of. And of course, you know, continue to present at conferences with a few more recent ones, Intel methods and even something. Um, we jumped on the bandwagon with publishing something about COVID. I, I felt a bit left out. Um, everyone was publishing something on COVID. So we we rushed out something cheap and dirty on COVID. Um, don't judge me. Um, so Again, we talk about um, learning um, communities. I think this, these images of these videos are our students working, not on their curriculum stuff. This is on our stuff, the stuff that we've been working on together, the, the, the intrinsic motivation, the extrinsic motivation to actually own these projects, to want to do it. And you can see here that this powerful image is of a learning community. And these are just a small number of them that are actually working um, and, and actually reinforcing that vertical longitudinal integration of anatomy beyond the early years which is, is a huge benefit to students as they um, journey through the medical program so um, we've had a great time along the way i've really enjoyed all the things that we've done and and actually just having a great time you know um, this has all been useful for my educational portfolio. I wouldn't lie, but I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't fun. Believe me, it's too much hard work just to do to get promoted. Um, I, uh, I We've had huge amounts of fun and I, I've really enjoyed seeing our students win awards um, and, you know, picking up awards together and taking them everywhere with me, really. It's just been a huge journey.
what I will say is thank you to these people stick out um, as people that have supported me. We all have those moments where um, we feel low, we lose confidence in ourselves. Am I doing the right thing? Maybe I should go back and do it the other way. Each and every one of these people on, on this screen have given me a pep talk, sometimes fairly brutally, Simon Kemp, other times a bit more, you know, kind of supportive. But no, I mean, sometimes you need those brutal conversations. Sometimes you need to be told those truths. And actually, sometimes you get it wrong. And uh, but every single person pictured here has supported me along the way and, and really picked me up when I faced setbacks or, you know, spurred me on when I've needed it. So thank you to them. And very finally, I told you I would get in uh, a chance to um, plug my podcast. Um, I will do it again while I take questions. So um, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your day. And I'll hand back to Helen to, to take some questions. Fantastic, Scott. Thank you so much. That was really, really inspiring and um, and just perfect timing. <laughs> so thank you very much. That was that was amazing.